Good evening and welcome to Victorian Opera's latest live stream event. I'm Scott Winfield, the host of the company's podcast, The Art of Opera. Tonight we're witnessing the early stages of new works the Victorian Opera has commissioned. It's an incredibly rare opportunity for us to join in the rehearsal room in such an early stage of these works in development. The works are based on celebrated 19th century French writer Gustave Flaubert's Trois Cons, or Three Tales. Throughout this live stream, we'll be speaking with each of the composers involved who have been assigned to each of these tales. Zach Huron about A Simple Heart, Dermot Tutty about St. Julian, and Stefan Casamanos about Herodias. We will also have an opportunity to hear a sample and excerpts from each of their compositions. Here's a message from Victorian Opera's artistic director, Richard Mills, about the genesis of this commission. Hello, I'm Richard Mills, artistic director of Victorian Opera, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about our project, Three Tales. Three Tales started with Plexus, the wonderful contemporary music ensemble, Monica Kuro, Stefan Casamenos, and Phil Arkenstall, who has a trio, have produced uh, already a, a sizable body of commissioned work, not writing it all themselves, but bringing it uh, to fruition through commissioning a range of established and upcoming composers. Now, where would a subject come from? For a trio, supplemented a little bit by percussion in this case, a trio of instrumentalists, a trio of composers, a trio of tales, three tales, trois contes of Gustave Flaubert crying out to be made into a musico-dramatic work. The three wonderful stories uh, of uh, un coeur simple, the, the servant Félicité and her parrot, Saint-Julien Hospitalier, which um, is a wonderful picaresque story of Julien and uh, his uh, transcendent ending, sucking on the sores of lepers being transported to heaven by an angel. And Herodias, who manipulated the beheading of John the Baptist and with typical Flaubertian irony the story closes with the observation that the head of John the Baptist was so heavy it needed two people to carry it. The stuff of drama, the stuff of legend and I think the stuff of really innovative and exploratory opera with these three great musicians, these three great individual compositional voices uh, and the magic of Plexus becoming an operatic ensemble. Wherever you're watching, please let us know. Let us know what you're watching on, where you're watching, and what you're doing. Use the hashtag VO3Tales and tag us as well at Victorian Opera. We would love to hear from you and love to hear your feedback throughout the night. As Richard noted in his message, we're very lucky to have the extraordinary ensemble Plexus involved in this new commission. Plexus play a very important work, uh, important role rather in the development of these new works and we're delighted that they'll be playing for us tonight as well as percussionist Brent Miller. Sopranos Catherine Radcliffe and Judith Dodworth, Dodds, Dodsworth rather join us tonight as well as tenor Brenton Spiteri and bass baritone Matthew Thomas. First up though we are delighted to welcome Dermot Tutty who has composed the work for St Julian. Hey Scott, how are you? If I can jump in Scott, Absolutely. I just have to say a few shout outs otherwise I'll get in trouble. Please do. I just want to say a quick hello to my students from the Victorian College of the Arts Secondary School and also my students at Melbourne Grammar School mm -hmm. and actually we have international guests. I actually teach at a school in Cambodia, uh, the ABCs and Rice School in Siem Reap, so a quick cheerio to them. Also, my dad, <laughs> my dad. <laughs> Hi, Barry. Yeah, my dad has taken a quick <laughs> break from flirting with the nurses at the Royal Melbourne Hospital <laughs> to tune in on his iPad. I think Nurse Star has helped him set up the iPad and Fantastic. tune into that. Well, hello to you all, and hello again to you, yeah. Dermot. Tell us about St. Julian. St. Julian, uh, I think it's very much uh, an opera in the style of Quentin Tarantino. Absolutely. Uh, in, in that, at the opening of the opera, very early on, we get a strong sense that by the end of the show, quite a number of these characters are going to be dead. Uh, 
St. Julian, I think, is a tale of a flawed individual who is cursed, uh, who, who makes a, a grave error and then ultimately seeks, seeks forgiveness for his faults and uh, for his error. And, uh, and it's the tale of, of that journey. Mm -hmm. From a compositional point of view, where did your process start? Uh, well, for me, with, with this whole project, the process started with the fact that Plexus invited me to be involved. Uh, I've had the good fortune of working with Plexus before on a, a project with students from the Victorian College of the Arts Secondary School from their chamber choir. And uh, they, are s they are musicians of the highest calibre, Plexus, but also they're such uh, supportive collaborators that that gives me the confidence to take risks and to explore new possibilities as a composer. So that was the first, I guess, important aspect of this project for me. And then the next thing was that Vic Opera actually offered me financial support to do it, which you know, sounds a little bit trivial, but that's a huge deal for a composer to be given the financial support, which enables you to free up some time to really invest in a project. And then I guess the next really important element for me was when having already read a translation of the original story, I received Daniel Keane's libretto, which I just found stunningly beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's so succinct. The story of St. Julian is very complex. It, it goes through his whole life's journey, so there are all these different stages. And we don't want these to be big, long operas. We want compact, impactful, exciting works that, 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 that mean something. Um, and we want to deliver that story quite quickly. And Daniel has been so succinct, but he's written such um, lyrical poetry. So I guess all these things came together. And then when I read his text, the melodies are already there for me almost. There's a lot of rhythm in text already, so the melodies are very much there for me. And then I guess the real work and real challenge for me begins there to write the parts for Plexus and Brent. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you've already noted that it's, it's quite a graphically violent work, not unlike a Quentin Tarantino film. We were joking mm -hmm. earlier that Lucia could be a Kill Bill and I suppose Jessica Pratt could be Uma Thurman. Yep. Um, <laughs> how did these aspects of the work influence you musically? Um, yeah, well, I, I think I approach that violence in a number of ways. You go with the violence and you have, um, you know, clashing harmonies, percussive, aggressive percussive playing from all the players, but then you play against it and you try and create moments of great stillness and serenity and hopefully beauty, and then that plays against that and hopefully works dramatically. Now, tonight we're hearing two excerpts from the work that you've mm -hmm. composed. Tell us about the first piece we're about to hear. Yeah, so I thought for the purpose of, we had so lucky to have a week this week, thanks to Vic Opera supporting us. We had a week to work with these players and the singers to, to hear it. You know, it's one thing to put it down in, in, in software and, and imagine what it's going to sound like, but we had a week to workshop. And I thought the smartest thing for me to do would be to work on the opening scene and the closing scene of the opera. So then I know where I'm starting from, where I'm headed, and I can work out how I'm going to get there. So first we hear the opening scene tonight. And in this opening scene, what we realise is that the story is going to be recounted to us by the spirits of three animals that have been killed by St Julian. And I guess the effect I'm after here is that three spirits enter, for they appear from another realm and eventually enter our realm to tell us the mm -hmm. story of St Julian. And they come and they tell us, people kill for different reasons, but Julian kills for love. But I think if we listen closely, we'll hear that they then tell us something else. Fantastic. Well, if you have any questions for Dermot, please do let us know via our chat feed and or Facebook, or Twitter, whatnot. Tag Victorian Opera and use the hashtag VO3Tales. But we're delighted to perform this first excerpt from Dermot's work. Enjoy.
Cross bow, spear, and knife, gaping frauds and dreaming, stinking of animal. I sleep in the wild. Congratulations, Dermot. Again, it's an absolutely incredible work. Um, how has it developed throughout the course of this week? I was thinking about that earlier today. I, I think the, the notes haven't changed a great deal. It's just been 
a case of being in the room together with a group of musicians, all who have great musical minds and a lot of experience, years and years of experience that we all bring into the room. And the biggest thing for me to do has been to shut up and listen. And um, I, I guess it's had the most effect on two of the elements of music from my students out there, uh, probably um, the dynamics and the tempo. And it's just finding balances between the different instruments, when you want to highlight things, when you want things to be hidden in the background, when you want voices to blend, when you want things to work against each other, and also get, getting the tempi right, and you know, speeding up and slowing down, I guess. It, yeah, that's, that's what's evolved the most this week, I think. Wonderful. Well, we're about to hear your second excerpt. What, what is that? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, this is the closing scene. So uh, after, after what we've just seen now, uh, Julian goes hunting and he kills an animal. He shoots a stag and this stag stumbles out on stage with an arrow in its skull, bleeding, and turns to Julian and says, you will kill your parents, murderer. And so Julian feels cursed and spends his life trying to avoid this curse. And of course, this is opera through, uh, we won't give away why, but he ends up killing his parents. And at the end of the opera, he's seeking forgiveness. And he, he's, as an old man, he is visited by a leper. And this leper comes to him and he says, I'm hungry, so he gives him food. He says, I'm thirsty, he gives him something to drink. He says, I'm tired, I'm cold. So he gives him a bed to sleep in. And the leper says, I'm still cold. Come and lie next to me. So he lies down next to the leper and the leper grips him and has this incredible grip that just keeps getting tighter and colder. And Julian turns to him in this moment of realisation and says, death, angel, whatever you are, take me, I am ready. If I am to be forgiven, let me suffer my forgiveness in heaven's darkness. And this is, you know, Daniel Keane's text. It's stunning. Absolutely. Well, we're about to hear this second uh, excerpt. But firstly, we've had a couple of people uh, messaging in, letting us know where they're watching from. We've had Adrian in the Mornington Peninsula. Hello to you. Um, <laughs> uh, Kelsey watching from Chelsea Heights. Leanne has messaged in, I think Dermot needs his own chat show. Oh, nice. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Hi, Leanne. I'm if I know that, Leanne. Yeah, you okay. might. Um, and... <laughs> Andrea watching from Brunswick who commented that your music was haunting and beautiful. Cheers, thank you. Well, we can't wait to hear this piece. Take it away.
clear and pale, as soft and cool and sweet. The birds and insects sung, the beasts howled, the sky Another stunning piece. Dermot, congratulations again. Um, Thanks so much. Cannot wait to see how this work continues to develop. Cheers. Fantastic. Thanks. Now, we've had a few more people contact us. We've had Hugo uh, comment, wonderful performance. I really uh, am enjoying the live stream, and Maureen as well, enjoying it very much. I hope this is a frequent event. Now, next up, we'll be speaking with Zach Huron, the composer of A Simple Heart. Hey man. How are you? Good, thank you. <laughs> now, tell us about A Simple Heart. Well, um, there's the story of Felicity, who's this beautiful young girl who's filled with kindness and trust. And um, as she goes out into the world and encounters ugly things mm -hmm. and ugly intentions, she, it seems to me that she averts her gaze away from that in order to preserve a, uh, like a childlike view of the world where um, good things should happen to good people. And um, I feel that when she averts her gaze from the ugly truth, she, she creates like a, uh, a cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. in her mind mm -hmm. where uh, subconscious voices in her mind are starting to go away from the, from the conscious thoughts. And I'm trying to reveal that musically. Fantastic. Now, Daniel King's uh, libretto is extraordinarily beautiful and captures the story beautifully, though it's quite different yeah. from, from the original text. How did that uh, change your approach to this work? Well, it changed everything because I started conceiving everything and I, I started hearing the sounds coming to me um, as soon as I started reading the original translation of the original story. And uh, that story is chronological. Um, so we see her deteriorate from this youthful um, full of life, kind of really alive young girl through this series of being used and, and discarded um, until she's basically um, gone deaf and blind, crippled, mad, 
and is now. Um, mm. So then Daniel, he with his um, libretto, he casts it so that um, she's on her deathbed, and it's the last couple of hours of her life, and she's, um, you know, seriously, uh, you know, really bad dementia and uh, nonsensically floating through limbo. Absolutely, it's a fragmented reality. Yeah, and then. Um, as her life force is slowly leaving her body, mm -hmm. she experiences these significant memories from her life. And so, musically, I've tried to make it come from the oblivion to a conscious thought forming itself, and mm -hmm. then a memory happening, and then fading back into the uh, the madness of um, nothingness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, if you have any questions for Zach, uh, please send them through via our chat feed or social media tag at Victorian Opera and use the hashtag VO3Tales. We're about to hear an excerpt from the work. Explain and introduce the piece. Well, um, basically I just started writing at the start. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what this is. And uh, I hope you like it. Very good. <laughs> Enjoy. Strong. 
Zach. <laughs> Firstly, congratulations again to you, but to, to Katie Radcliffe and to Plexus, that was absolutely yeah. extraordinary, so Beautiful. thank you so, so much. Thank you. Um, throughout, we've had a couple of questions and comments. Malin have uh, described it as enchanting, and Hayley also said that having the opportunity to listen to these compositions is inspiring. Um, We've also had a message from Richard and Philippa watching on Facebook Live in sale. <laughs> now, I think I know who that is. Hello to Richard Mills and to Philippa Safey. Um, <laughs> currently on the road as part of Victorian Opera's regional tour, and we hope you're having a lovely time. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Rod, who congratulated you as well, and said, has the collaboration during this week inspired you in any unexpected ways? Massively. How so? Every way. I think um, the way I see it, the, uh, the most important aspect of any kind of creative act is the personnel. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the people down here with Victorian yeah. Opera are staggeringly 
gifted and accomplished and it's been amazing. Thanks so much for having me. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. That's well, it's, uh, lovely to hear. Uh, we had a question from Adrian as well. She said, this is beautiful, Zach. Who has inspired your work the most? Uh, well, you know, you think about the people that you're writing for and um, I try to, I try to, uh, I don't know, I don't actually understand really how it understands, but sounds come mm -hmm. and I try to uh, somehow have it be the sounds that belong to the person that I'm writing for. And then, so then those sounds will accumulate and then uh, uh, Daniel Keane had a mega impact, massive impact. Did you get a chance to speak to him at all during the process or was it literally receiving the libretto? I received the libretto and yes. my mind was blown. <laughs> Very good. Well, Zach, we can't wait to see how you develop the work. Congratulations Thank you. again. Cheers. Thanks for having me. <laughs>
uh, this new uh, religion, Christianity, uh, which is uh, espoused by uh, uh, John, John, uh, Baptist. John the Baptist, oh. um, Elijah, Yochanan mm -hmm. in this particular opera yes. is his name. And um, so he is really quite critical mm -hmm. of Herodias and she will do anything to get rid of him, to get him out of the picture because she doesn't like being criticised. What so does she do? <laughs> well, <laughs> would you believe she <laughs> enlists her, her daughter from the previous marriage mm -hmm. to uh, seduce her husband, who's not in my opera, uh, but he is in some of the other operas, some of the other operatic settings of this, mm -hmm. Herod. She seduces, so, uh, Herodias' daughter Salome is enlisted to seduce Herod and uh, in that final moment of seduction to mm -hmm. demand uh, the head of John the Baptist. And so what happened when Oscar Wilde decided to retell this story is that um, the lust that Salome felt for Herod was conflated with a lust for uh, Yochanan, for John the Baptist. And so that's what this particular opera centres on. Mm -hmm. It centres on Herodias and her very serious, and actually um, I, I really think it's quite a reasonable uh, point of view that she has. Why should she be criticised by someone for making, you know, a life choice when, you know, in the Bible there are numerous examples of, you know, worse life choices, as she points out in the libretto that you'll hear. Mm -hmm. And um, then uh, Yochanan with his religious sensibilities and then Salome with her uh, really uh, questionable uh, position, uh, sometimes unreasonable, where she's lusting for this man who eventually she's going to demand the head of. So, um, very good. make of that what you will. Yes. <laughs> now, we need to let you run away to the piano in just a sure. moment's time, but before we do, can you quickly outline who will be playing each role and what will we seeing them doing? Of course. So, in the role of Salome, we have Judith Dodsworth on the right, and, we, uh, and Salome begins in this opera by showing us what kind of a character she is, and then she's sort of laughing maniacally and then uh, when eventually she starts singing, she's singing about this beautiful guy, Yochanan, uh, who she's clearly in love with. Then um, to our left we have said beautiful guy, Yochanan, <laughs> who is, uh, who is um, played by Brenton Spiteri and every time Yochanan speaks his uh, text, as Daniel has written the libretto, is in an even number of lines, which I think is really interesting because it's quite square in Absolutely. its conception and his everything that he says is really a vision that he's having which is coming to him mm. from another place wherever that place is uh, God as far as he's concerned and then uh, in the middle we have Herodias who is desperately trying to argue her case with him and uh, and, and justify herself really and if she was living now I think I think we'd completely understand her she's a very reasonable woman so and we have Katie Radcliffe on the part of Herodias. Fantastic. Stefan, we better let you run away to the I'll piano. Yes. Uh, if you have any questions for Stefan during the performance, please let us know via your chat feed or social media tag at Victorian Opera and send your questions using the hashtag, hashtag VO3Tales. We would love to hear from you. Enjoy this excerpt from Herodias. Oh. 
words are like a stream of water, sweet as the ripple in Milan, on the banks of the Jordan, his face of the spirit.
Another absolutely extraordinary work. How's this for a Friday night? That was amazing. Thank you so much to Plexus and all of our performers. That was really incredible. Uh, we've received uh, feedback during the performance and a, a couple of questions for Stefan as well. Uh, Francis has commented, I'm watching at home and I think we should do this more often. And Francis, I think, I think we all agree. Um, what else do we have? Uh, Stefan, we are going to get in just a moment's time. We've got a comment from Albie and he would like to know, Stefan, for you, what's the next step in the process? The next step for me is uh, to take a big deep breath. Yes. <laughs> well deserved. I mean, big really, deep breath, I say. Who writes that? <coughs> um, There's no way of knowing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> some, sometimes create higher expectations for myself than I really should um, as a player. Um, the next step for me is to, uh, to uh, process the information of um, the dramatic impact of what I've written so far, yes. um, which is um, something which is going to take a, a while, I think. Mm -hmm. um, normally it takes me uh, maybe a year or two to write a piece uh, to go through the process, and um, this is quite early for me to respond to the libretto, because we only got the libretto a few months ago, mm -hmm. and um, which is fine, but um, and, and it's been an inspiring pros process, but um, um, I think the gestation period is uh, really a longer one uh, for, for any work that I write, but particularly for a work of the, you know, this sort of magnitude with, with such an important text. So I think I'll be sort of putting it away for a couple of months and then bringing it out again and re-examining my material and then seeing how the next 12 and a half minutes is going to go. Fantastic. Well, we can't wait to hear how it develops. Stefan, thank congratulations you. and thank you again. No worries. Now, that brings us to the end of tonight's live stream, but thank you so much to everyone who's joined us watching and those who sent us in questions as well. We've loved hearing from you and your feedback, your thoughts throughout the night. So thank you so much for, for joining us and for participating. Uh, the work is expected to be staged in a future Victorian opera season. So keep your eyes peeled and please join us then. A big thank you as well to all of our composers, to Plexus, to all of our performers and singers, to our head of music, Phoebe Briggs, and to Deborah Vanderwerp, um, our wonderful crew, and of course, the team at Five Stream. Thank you so much for joining us once again. I'm Scott Winfield. Have a great weekend and good night. <laughs>